Hi, this is Celeste, and this is the Celestial Report for February 2nd, 2020, and we're going to dive into the Federal Register today with information that you need to know and that you may face as early as this week, and that is why it is critical to get you this information, and that is why I'm doing this special broadcast. So anyway, this is the Federal Register that we're going to um, dig into. So right now, what we have going before I dig into the Federal Register is algorithmic warfare. Um, all the all the elements of creation have been weaponized, and also the words. And both this is on both the side of God and the side of evil. And just as a really quick refresher, if you followed my work, if you don't, um, just look it up. Uh, it, it's pivotal to know some a little bit of the backstory as we go into this. There were three Asilomar conferences. Uh, the first one was in 1975, and the decision was made um, by the policymakers to genetically modify all life on Earth. That's animal, human, plants, everything. The second component was the geoengineering component. It was in the form of a binary weapon style. And so obviously that has been accomplished or is in process right now. Um, that component, the framework, even though they had started before was, I think it was 2010. And then in 2018 was the last component and that is artificial intelligence or AI management of all life on Earth. Another thing that you need to be aware of is that back in 2005, the United Nations through the FAO issued three 1500 page each documents that are living documents and every May they are increased so they don't just stay the same, they actually grow in size kind of like a beast. And one of them is called the Terrestrial Animal Health Code. And yes, in this code, you are defined as an animal and need to be managed. Anything in this uh, code that applies to animals is applicable to humans. There is also the Aquatic Code. And there's also very interesting, the manual for diagnostic and vaccinations. And I've been watching this since 2005 and many people didn't even realize that it existed. And so that's where you're going to see in the days to come, all these diagnostics and vaccinations emanate forth and are regulated by the United Nations. Um, it's also important for you to realize that independent labs are extremely rare right now. Maybe there's a handful of them, but almost all the labs are a part of the system, the global system already. And let's say they say that you have some sort of a pathogen and you don't believe them. Um, and you want to get a third party opinion or independent opinion on whether you have this pathogen or not, it's almost going to be impossible for you to get that because they're all, all the labs are one with, like I said, there's a few independent uh, labs, like probably Mike Adams is one of the few independent labs, but for the most part, um, they're all going to be lockstep with the same message. Now, another thing just before we dig in is if you paid attention to the White House announcement this week after the World Health um, Organization declared the 2019 novel coronavirus a public health emergency of international concern, the White House uh, in harmonization with the World Health Organization did their announcement and we must pay particular attention to what they said. They are operationalizing. This is an operation and it is a multi-layered cross-agency 
public health response. And what you need to know is in, within our constitution, at the time our constitution was formed, um, public health was a big issue. We didn't have the sanitation. Um, there wasn't the access to running water or you know, basic understanding of different health things that we have and take for granted today. And so the founders of the constitution, conscience uh, that they wanted a healthy people, they kind of left uh, public health out on its own apart from the constitution. But right now, global entities uh, see those, ho those holes in the constitution. And if you say, or if you use the words, um, for the health, safety, and well-being of the of the public, that basically suspends any constitution constitutional protections that you have, and you really need to understand that. Another thing, um, just before we dig in, uh, we got a couple more things, and then we'll just dig right in. First off, the coronavirus, I've been hearing, oh, this is just a coronavirus. That's, you know, you get this little tiny cold and you're going to get better in no time at all. You need to understand that the novel in front of the coronavirus means that this is a laboratory engineered virus. It, you might want to think of it as a GMO of viruses, and it is weaponized. It has potential for great devastation. Whether it's real or perceived, this is the biological 9-11 attack that has been unleashed upon the world. So what has been established, because they knew that this was coming, is a pan-enterprise ar architecture for biosurveillance with interoperability. And what that means is, I mean, it's got several parts to it. There's loose coupling, there's contracts, um, which we're going to discuss, there's autonomy, there's the AI portion, this is going to be run by artificial intelligence, abstraction, uh, reusability, everything has to be reusable these days, composability, statelessness, so it goes beyond sovereign borders, and as I've stated for the last several weeks, that this is sovereignty's last hurrah. After this, we're going to see a real concerted effort by global governance to er eradicate states and discoverability. And you might think, oh, this is new. This is just this novel coronavirus is something new. No, um, actually, it was cited in the August 15th, 2016 Federal Register. Um, at, for under uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome, um, which was also related to the Middle East respiratory syndrome, which is MERS, and also related to hemorrhagic fever, uh, Lassa and Ebola, and also the highly pathogenic avian influenzas H5N1 and H7N9. So, now, what we are going to be looking at today is the Federal Regi Register proposed um, regulations. Um, they were submitted by the Health and Human Services on August 15th, 2016. They were addressing the control of communica communicable diseases, and it became finalized on October 15th, 2016. What you're going to see in the next few minutes is basically a medical martial law that was laying in wait for something like the coronavirus to come into being. So to really understand it, what I'm going to focus on today, although the document itself is 88 pages, are the definitions because you might run into this tomorrow. I'm not saying uh, that you will, and God forbid you won't, uh, but it is possible, and that when the WHO did their announcement and when the United States did their announcement, um, it basically put, changed our paradigm. 
So I'm just going to go down the definitions in alphabetical order so it is not how they are presented in the actual document. So you're going to see that there are agreements and an agreement is entered into between the CDC and an individual expressing a voluntary agreement. This is like forced voluntary between the parties that the individual will observe public health measures off authorized under this part as the CDC considers reasonably necessary to protect the public health, including quarantine, isolation, conditional release, medical examination, hospitalization, vaccinations, and treatment. And so you are going to be forced into a contractual agreement with the CDC. So um, you need to be aware of that. You can all apprehension means the temporary taking into custody of an individual or a group for purposes of determining whether federal quarantine isolation or conditional release is warranted. Um, this means that any of us at any time, especially within the next month, can be apprehended by public health officials or law enforcement and forced into what we're going to see here in a few minutes. The communicatable uh, stage means the stage during which an infectious agent may be transmitted either directly or indirectly from an infected individual to another individual. That means that they may not be symptomatic. I mean, it starts at the very first day and a person with a novel coronavirus may not be symptomatic for 10 days. The conditional release means surveillance as defined in uh, 42 of the CFR 71.1 uh, and includes public health supervision through in-person visits by health officials or their designees, telephone, or through electronic or internet-based internet monitoring. There's actually a little bit more about that that we will go into in a few moments. So you might be released like um, and self-quarantine into your home, but it's going to be a conditional release and you're going to have all these checkups and electronics um, to, to make sure. You're basically going to be placed in electronic uh, prison. A contaminated environment means the presence of an infectious agent on a surface, including inanimate objects or substances, including food, water, or air. Um, and it can be on, so it can be on an inanimate object. I can't stress that enough. This has the power to stop all commerce within the United States and all imports which would be economically devastating to our, our country and to the world. But you need to understand that this is where we're at. So once again, that word is contaminated environment. A conveyance means an aircraft, a train, a road, a vehicle, a vessel as defined in this uh, section or other means of transportation, including the military. So now we're going to go back and see some of what this electronic um, conditional release might include. So electronic or internet based monitoring means mechanisms or technologies allowing for temporary public health supervision of an individual under conditional release. And it may include electronic mail, SMS, texts, video conferencing, webcam technologies, where you would have like a webcam in your house monitoring you, integrated voice response systems to ensure that you didn't get out and take a walk, um, entry of information into web-based forums, 
wearable tracking devices, and other mechanisms or technologies as determined by the director or the supervising health authority. There is also clauses in this um, federal register dealing with communicable diseases for any future electronic or internet-based internet monitoring. So maybe the technology hasn't been yet developed, but um, they included that in there so that they didn't have to redo the whole thing, the whole document. Okay, so who is an ill person? So basically, according to the definitions, this person has to have a fever measuring at least 100.4 degrees or 38 degrees centigrade or greater, or one that uh, feels warm to the touch, um, or gives a history of feeling feverish, and accompanied by one or more of the following a skin rash, difficulty in breathing, persistent cough, decreased consciousness or confusion of recent onset, new unexplained bruising or bleeding without previous injury, persistent diarrhea, persistent vomiting other than air sickness or travel sickness, headache with a stiff neck, or obviously appears to be unwell. So the person can either self-report or if let's say you're traveling and somebody else notices it, it could be somebody in an airport, a TSA person, um, they can report you. Any fever that has persisted for more than 48 hours, um, Three, has the symptoms or other indications of a communicable disease as the CDC may announce through the posting in the Federal Register. An incubation period means the time from the moment of exposure to an infectious agent that causes a communicable disease until the signs and symptoms of the communicable disease appears in the individual. For a quarantinable um, communicable disease, incubation uh, period means the pre-communicable uh, stage. And I, that's my concern for the next 30 days that we're kind of in this, in this window for, in the United States. An indigent person means an individual whose annual in family income is below 150% of the applicable poverty guidelines and it, that is periodically updated in the federal register by the Health and Human Services under Title 42 of the U.S. Code 92 or 99022 and if no income is earned liquid assets totaling less than 15% of the applicable poverty line. That becomes important because you may be forced into treatment um, and vaccines, um, hospitalization, and this is for determining who has who is responsible for paying those bills. Um, there's they also address master or operator with respect to a vessel. This means a sea crew member with the responsibility for vessel operation and navigation, um, but it's also a similar individual with responsibility for any conveyance. That can be your own car, it can be a train, it can be a truck, um, any way that you can convey, um, it will be against the law to uh, transport a person that is under the thumb of the HHS um, and we'll go into the how they get that in a few minutes. So what potential medical exams might you um, be forced to endure? So that is a medical examination means the assessment of an individual by an authorized health worker that does not have to be your doctor. It could be um, anybody that they rope into and, uh, and uh, 
designate like a TSA worker. Um, they do swell, swear oaths, but it is to the agency and not to the Constitution. Anyway, back to the examination, it is to determine the individual's health status and potential public health risks to others and may include the taking of a medical history, a physical examination, collection, collection of human biological samples, as long as they're non-invasive for laboratory testing to diagnose or confirm the presence or the extent of the of an infection with a quarantinable communicable disease, which the novel coronavirus is. Now you need to understand that these, once this medical examination and the results are handed over to possibly third parties, then those records become public. And there's a lot right now going on that once, uh, and that's the whole push behind this electronic uh, uh, medical records because it goes through third party um, carriers and then your information becomes public and it becomes public so that they can supposedly determine what is the public good and for the good. So you basically sacrifice your privacy for the public good. Now you may hear the word medical representative and that means a physician, nurse practitioner, or similar medical professional qualified to diagnose and treat infectious disease and who is appointed by the Health and Human Services Secretary or the CDC Director and may include um, HHS or CDC employees and they may assist an indigent individual that is under federal quarantine, isolation, or conditional uh, release with a medical review under this part. What is a um, medical review? It basically means a physician, a nurse practitioner, or similar medical professional qualified to diagnose and treat infectious disease once again, appointed by the HHS secretary or the CDC director to conduct medical reviews under this part and may include a HHS or CDC employee. Um, and it is to establish um, a federal order for quarantine isolation or conditional re release. I think I forgot to put in here that you do have the right to appeal uh, this process, but it is under um, this really strange thing like global migration and something else, but I will get that information to you. Um, I just forgot to put it, um, it's hard to synthesize down an 88 page government document. So what do they mean by non-invasive? Because so here you are at the train station, the bus station, the airport, and you have to be assessed um, and they are talking about non-invasive procedures so what might you expect so that means it will be conducted by an authorized health worker or another individual with suitable training and includes uh, before i get into the details of that um, it's important to know that the volunteer citizen army has been uh, mobilized for this so it could be a cert person uh, medical reserve corps veterinary corps um, americorps senior corps so it is just somebody that maybe has had 30 hours of training i'm just i don't know how many hours of training it just says suitable training it does not define that Anyway, so it might not be the health, a health professional as you would know it. And so this exam will include an exam of your ears, nose, mouth, temperature assessment using ear, oral, um, with a cutaneous, which is a skin or a non-contact thermometer or thermal uh, uh, imaging, oscillation, external palpitations, external blood pressure, 
and other procedures that do not involve puncturing or incising of the skin or insertion of uh, instruments or foreign materials into the body or a body cavity, including the ears, nose, and mouth. It can include DNA swabs, but here's where they pl play the gray because one thing that I noticed back in 2016 is that they said that they could not, you could not use an instrument or foreign material into the body or a body cavity, but I do not think that they are excluding body cavity searches. And that might be in things like airports and bus terminals and trains. So you need to be prepared. They do not address it. Um, and because they haven't excluded it, uh, you might be faced with that. The pre-communicable stage means the stage at the beginning upon an individual's earliest opportunity for exposure to an infectious agent and ending upon the individual entering or re-entering the communicable stage of the disease. If the individual does not enter the communicable stage, the last date at which the individual could reasonably be expected to have the potential to enter in or re-enter the communicable disease. And basically by this definition right now, all Americans have been exposed um, to this pre-communicable dis disease, not necessarily because we've run into anybody from China, but maybe somebody from China before they started to limit airlines uh, traffic into the United States may have been communicable and left um, the disease, let's say on a door handle, they sneezed on a counter, you know, that type of thing. So basically this opens up that every single American has the potential to be in the pre-communicable stage right now. And they are gonna to need to manage that. Then they're going to public health ha prevention measures for an assessment. That means that we need to be assessed um, whoever they pick out for these non-invasive uh, procedures. And it may mean observation, questioning, the review of our travel documents, uh, records review. It might even include our financial documents. And I have, um, I have good reason to believe that your financial documents will be a part of this. Uh, non other non-invasive means to de determine an individual's health status and potential health, health risks to others. A qualifying stage is a statutorily defined in 42 U.S. Code 264 D2, um, the communicable stage of a quarantinable communica a communicable disease uh, to the pre-communicable stage of a quarantinable communicable disease, but only if the quarantinable communicable disease would likely be likely to cause a public health emergency if transmitted to other individuals. And as we were just notified by the White House, we are all in the qualifying stage of a pre-communicable stage of a quarantinable communicable disease. So that's what we were told by the White House is that we are potent. We have potential to spread this uh, novel uh, coronal virus. Reasonably believed to be infected is a person. These are words that you're going to hear if you are confronted with this situation. Um, the person or health person health person may say you are reasonably believed to be infected, and so what that means is. An individual means specifically um, articulate facts upon which the public officer could reasonably draw inference that the individual has been exposed either directly or indirectly to the infectious agent that causes the quarantinable 
communicable disease through contact with an infected person or the infected person's bodily fluids, a contaminated environment. Um, and I'm just going to insert, okay, so you ordered something on Amazon and it's this virus has been going since November. So you ordered something from Amazon, it has contaminants, uh, you got got your package from Amazon over the holidays and now your environment is contaminated. You see how insidious this is? You, it, you can also be reasonably um, infected if um, through an intermediary host or a vector um, like a mosquito or a rat or something like that or exposure to an individual that may be harboring um, a body or the infectious um, agent of a quarantinable communicable disease. So there are requirements relating to travelers under a federal order of isolation, quarantine or conditional uh, release. And those, so you're going to get in writing that a federal order that you are to be in isolation, you are in quarantine, or you have this conditional release. It's not going to be a verbal thing. It will be in writing. And like I said, you do have the right to an appeal, but I can tell you from the appeal process to a regulatory agency, you can appeal all you want, spend all your time and money, and the chances of you getting that appeal, especially when the health of the public is um, a th threatened, um, it's not going to happen, but you can try. They, they put it down that you might. Uh, so you might be granted a, a permit to travel um, and that if you are, you know, it's going to be why the travel is being requested. They're going to ask you the mode of transportation, the place, places or individuals that you are going to visit, any precautions, what are you going to do to prevent potential transmission and spread of this communicable disease and any other information determined necessary by the CDC to assess your health condition and the potential of this communicable disease to spread to others. The CDC will consider all requests for a permit, a permit taking into consideration the risk of introduction transmission or spread of the communicable disease and then you are expected to um, be in compliance with whatever their decision has been they've come to. An individual who has had his permit denied or has a travel permit which is suspended or revoked may submit a written appeal to the director it must be in writing, state the factual basis for the appeal and must be submitted to the director within 10 days of the denial, suspension or revocation of the permit. The CDC will promptly issue a written response to the appeal which shall constitute the agency's final action. An operator of any conveyance in interstate, this is important for truck drivers, car, anyone driving, um, uh, people taking the or uh, driving a bus, a uh, train, aircraft. The operator of any conveyance in interstate traffic shall not transport any individual whom the operator knows or reasonably should know. Um, to be under a federal order or agreement of isolation, quarantine, or conditional release unless such an individual presents a permit issue issuing, uh, issued by the CDC authorizing such travel. So it's against the law 
And there are some pretty steep fines if you are found guilty of um, transporting anybody who may be infected. So apprehension and detention of persons with quarantinable communicable diseases, the CDC may authorize the apprehension. So you can be apprehended on the street. I mean, they can just, some AmeriCorps thugs can apprehend you on the street um, and direct you to the nearest uh, health facility for a medical exam with possible quarantine isolation or a condi conditional uh, release. And this is another thing that you really need to know is that the corona novel coronavirus is there are several executive orders that include this these are presidential executive orders i think they started in if, if memory serves me right 2004 or 2003 so um they've got all their bases covered so this is not only regulatory but it's covered by um, presidential executive order so you're basically not going to get out of it public health prevention measures to detect communicable disease uh, so the cdc may conduct public health prevention measures at u.s airports seaports railway stations bus terminals and other locations where individuals gather to engage in interstate travel and um, apply non-invasive procedures as determined appropriate by the CDC to detect the presence of communicable diseases. And I want you to understand that it's not only places of conveyance or travel, but they, in most states, they passed laws like early in the two, early 2000s that uh, they can do checkpoints anywhere like you could have a checkpoint set up at the end of your driveway, the end of your community street, let's say, or even in front of your church. So a, a checkpoint can be anywhere and we have no say. Um, we will have to go through all their questions and their assessments. And we also may be required to provide contact information such as U.S. and foreign addresses, telephone numbers, email addresses, and other contact information, um, as well as destinations, health histories, and travel histories. This has all been beta tested with animals. And so if you think that this is a new system, it's not. It's been operational for a uh, probably almost 20 years and so they're very good at um, the process is well nailed down for this um, of course there are processes to report death or illnesses uh, on board an aircraft also any cruise liners or anything like that there are certain you, you have to report the deaths. Unlike, um, so my husband and I got on this one conversation, like, God forbid, what happens if you died? And he told me, oh, just throw my, my body out to the wolves. And it's like, well, that was just to get me off your back type of um, response. But that's not going to be possible. And if you did throw your sweetheart out to the wolves, then you're going to have to answer uh, that you threw the, um, your sweetheart out to the wolves. And then you're probably going to be charged with uh, spreading a zoonotic uh, disease to wildlife. And that in itself uh, carries some stiff ramifications. So that's just a little insert there. Um, medical examinations. Uh, the CDC may require an individual to undergo the medical examination for the purposes of quarantine isolation or quarantine release of a quarantinable communicable disease, which have we, as we've discussed, this is. 
the individuals reasonably believed to be infected based on the results of medical examination may be isolated or if such results are inconclusive or unavailable, individuals may be quarantined condi or conditionally released in accordance with this part. Um, for the most part, uh, the CDC and Health and Human Services has um, addressed payment for care and treatment and they it really kind of looks like they're going to cover it except that if you have like a third party of course they have they're only going to pay the bottom the lowest amount and so your carrier whether it's a private insurance or um medicare or medicaid um, is probably going to pick up quite a bit of that as long as they use the Medicare system using international classification of diseases and clinical modification, which is known as the ICD or the CM. Requirements relating to the issuance of a federal order for quarantine, isolation, or conditional release, a federal order authorizing quarantine, isolation, or conditional release shall be in writing signed by a CDC authorizing official and it shall include the following information. The identity of the individual or group subject to the order, the location of the quarantine or isolation of the case of conditional release, the entity to who and means by which the individual shall report for uh, public health supervision and it shall be there shall be an explanation of factual basis underlying the CDC's reasonable belief that the individual is in the qualifying stage of a quarantinable communicable disease and right now we're all in that place an explanation of the factual basis underlying the CDC's reasonable belief that the individual is moving or about to move from one state, state to another or constitutes a probable source of infection to others who may be moving from one state to another. Um, and there are criminal uh, penalties for violating a federal order of quarantine and isolation or conditional release. So you may not receive this federal order authorizing quarantine, isolation or conditional release. Um, it says that it must be promptly served to the individual, but there are certain circumstances. Let's say a whole city um, is under this order it may be published or posted in a conspicuous location if the federal order is applicable to a group of individuals and individual services would be impractical. So let's say Los Angeles, just hypothetically, um, all became um, needed to be under this uh, federal order. They would just post it you would probably hear it on the media. You might hear it um, on social media. You would certainly hear it on the CDC's or HHS's uh, websites. But it is something that you need to pay attention to because if you uh, are, if you don't know about it and you violate it, you are going to have criminal um, action taken against you. So it. Um, ignorance is not going to get you off. There is mandatory reassessment of a federal order for quarantine, isolation, or conditional release. The CDC shall reassess the need to continue the quarantine, isolation, or condi conditional release of an ind individual no later than 72 hours after the order. So basically, um, you may be reassessed. Um, you might have to put up with your quarantine isolation or conditional release for three days. And then after that, they will uh, reassess and see if it's necessary for you to continue. But then once again, the agency's final decree is their final decree and you really 
don't have much once they've made the final decision. Uh, they may uh, continue the federal order. It may be modified or it could be rescinded um, as part of that process. Some of this is um, they, they come about it. They say the same thing in many different ways. So that you get the point, and they don't—they've dotted all their I's and crossed all their T's, and so some of this I don't have to rehash because it would just bore you to tears. I'm fine with a big long document, but maybe you are not. So then this part is talking about a medical reviewer may order a medical examination of an individual when the medical reviewer's professional judgment, such an examination would assist in assessing the individual's um, medical condition. So here we're bringing in some other parties and it can be by um, many different means. So there are records that are kept, um, administrative records relating to federal quarantine, isolation, and conditional release, and you need to know that those things are kept forever, um, and it can include medical, laboratory, epidemiological that are in the agency's position or possession and were considered in the issuing a federal quarantine isolation and conditional release order or any subsequent federal orders. And it can include lots of different things. We all have a dossier and it can include all of those, uh, that information, uh, travel, uh, financial, as I mentioned, internet, um, all sorts of different things. So I, I think, I'll just one more before we go into the penalties. Um, so the CDC may enter into an agreement with an individual based on the terms as the CDC considers reasonably necessary, indicating that the individual uh, consents coercively, but they say voluntarily, but it's coercively to any public health measure authorized under this part and this is 70.18, including quarantine, isolation, conditional release, medical examination, hospitalization, vaccination, and treatment, provided that the individual's consent shall not be considered as a pr prerequisite to the exercise of any authority. So basically they're saying that, that um, this contractual agreement between you and the CDC allows them to do anything to you. So it's also important for you to know that on August 16th in the year 2000, the secretary transferred the authority for interstate control of communicable disease, including the authority to apprehend, examine, detain, and conditionally release individuals moving from one state to another from the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, to the CDC. This authority is implemented in 42 CFR Part 70. The FDA retained its concurrent regula regulatory authority under Section 361 of the Public Health Service. And when you are going to make an appeal, um, you need to do it to the public, Health Service Act um, addressing authority of CDC's function 361 through 369 covered in 42 U.S. Code 264 through 272 to the Division of Global Migration and Quarantine and the acronym for that is DGMQ. And so that is who you would um, address and appeal to. It's also um, under this, uh, these public health um, measures that have just been declared upon us, um, you're going to also see things like um, inspections of your home, your private residences, um, fumigation, uh, disinfection, we have seen that happening in China. People going around, you know, with the sprayers. 
Um, we're going to start seeing that in the United States. Uh, sanitation, past exterminations, destruction of animals or articles found to be dangerous, infection to human beings. That's going to really escalate the UN um, anti-animal agenda and uh, really is going to distance people from their livestock. They're already telling people here, don't have limit your contact with animals. I uh, don't have contact with animals, live animals. In China, they're actually having people killing their dogs and their cats and their pets. Um, so that you might see that coming to America really soon. Um, I have one article that was sent to me on that topic and I said over my dead body. But anyway, moving right along, um, there were uh, the transportation or the TSA um, may conduct routine warrantless uh, searches on all carry-on luggage without individualized suspicion which means you know now it's TSA on steroids go, go ramp, ramp it they don't need a warrant they can do anything they da darn well want and the problem is it's now it's not just going to be contained to the airports it is going to be uh, bus stations, train stations, boats, um, checkpoints, and so these uh, routine security uh, search checkpoints, uh, they say, they claim, they uh, pass the constitutional muster because compelling public interest in curbing um, piracy and other acts of thing acts um, it gives them the authority to do it and there is a statute that's uh, cited here Rasaki versus pistol in the first uh, circuit court 2014 so um, you may be denied to board any um, conveyance um, in the in the future and um just so okay um if you see a tsa and they're screening everybody and taking their temperature and doing this and doing that um if you walk away is that going to protect you no it is not going to protect you and they've practiced this at uh dwe checkpoints people that have tried to avoid them they they hunt them down so uh, by simply walking away and saying I do not consent to this is not going to be effective um, they have the power to apprehend you and do whatever they wish to you and so then there's a section that requires um, individuals who are undergoing uh, the assess assessment uh, basic contact tracing information which uh, would be used to locate and notify individuals of potential exposure to a, a communicable disease. Now when we're talking about some of the electronic measures that they are talking about here they do say non-invasive but I do want to bring to your attention something that I was consulted on maybe 20 years ago. So there was a man in Eastern Washington and he bought a mobile home and it was not connected to, let's say the system. And he wanted it that way. And um, he went ahead and did his water and his electric or on his own. And, but that meant that he didn't pay all of the inspection fees and uh, permits that are required for doing uh, utilities. Um, a person is not allowed to do that. And they were trying to figure out a way of how to go after this man. So unfortunately, um, he went to town and there was some little tiny parking uh, infraction. I don't know if he didn't park within the uh, 
white lines. It was very minor. It had to do with parking. All I remember, I mean, it's 20 years ago. And they arrested him. He ended up being put in prison. And uh, they said that when they apprehended him and he, oh, and he became a custodian of the government. And that's what they're talking here. When you're apprehended, you become a custodian of the government and you lose the rights over your own body. This is what they're saying. This is very, very dangerous. So in the case of this man, um, he they put a RFID in him. Now this document says um, that they are not going to do an invasive um, RFID system, that it would be a wearable or something akin to that. But I have not looked at, this was 2016, have they amended this to include um, things like RFID implantation for monitoring and surveillance purposes? Um, and also the taking of blood. So what's important to remember is that once you are apprehended, you become a custodian of the government and they take ownership over you. That is extremely troubling to me. It's important to know that, uh, that this is all in line with the Commerce uh, Clause in the Constitution um, and we can cite the United States versus Lopez, 514 U.S., 549, 558, 559, 1995, which the Commerce Clause authorizes the regulation of the instrumentalities of interstate um, commerce, which includes persons or things that are engaging in internet, interstate, interstate commerce even um, though it is a threat to interstate commerce may come from this interstate activity. So they realize that this might shut down our economy and the Commerce cl um, Clause is aware that this biological can do that, but that it, this is an instrumentality of the interstate commerce um, to basically shut it down so that it is giving them the power to do that. So another thing that is troubling um, is on page, if you do go to this document, it's on page four two or five four, excuse me, five four two four three. And they are saying that um, they're talking about privileges and that they are conferring when we travel, it's a privilege um, and that we don't have a right to travel. So basically a refresher for all of us is a right that is something inherited by God and a privilege is something conferred to us by uh, government or man to us. So basically they're saying that they have the right under um, a communicable disease situation to interfere with our travel, uh, interfere with our travel and restrict us in travel because our travel is um, a privilege. So that's something that you need to know when dealing with this. So what are some other things that we're gonna see under this is, inspections, fumigations, disinfection, sanitation, pest extermination, destruction of animals or uh, articles found to be sources of dangerous infection to human beings and other measures which are not defined, um, but they will be defined by the um, secretary. Oh, and here's the executive order that covers uh, severe acute respiratory syndromes um, and influenzas caused by novel or re-emergent influenza viruses that are causing or having potential to cause pandemic are covered under executive order 13295 signed April 4th, 2003 
amended to Executive Order 13375 on April 1st, 2005, and Executive Order 13674 um, signed July 31st, 2014. So what are the penalties? So if a person is in violation of this part, they are subject to a fine of no more than $100,000 if the violation does not result in a death or one year in jail or both, or a fine of no more than $250,000 if the violation results in a death or one year in jail or both as otherwise provided by law. Violations by organizations are subject to fines of no more than $200,000 per event if the violation does not result in a death and or $500,000 per event if the violation results in a death or is otherwise provided by law. And what you need to understand, although not specifically in this particular document, but most penalties are based on a grid matrix. And basically that means that it's like a per day per event. And they could th say that it's like that day was a single event and the next day. And so it, it incrementally um, gets larger, like if you're in violation for two days and it goes up to you're, you're in violation for three days, it goes up exponentially. Um, and so they can play with these types of things. I am pretty sure, although it's not specified in this document, that it is using a penalty matrix, which means that you're not just talking $100,000 to $500,000. You're talking about that amount per day and they may consider it each day a separate um, event. So you need to be aware of that when assessing if you are going to be in violation of whatever decree that HHS and CDC want to uh, place on you. Now you need to understand that this is, there's also foreign quarantines, um, and because that's because of the contaminated environment and the potential for people. So what types of data elements might they ask uh, of you and that you are forced to supply for them? You need your full uh, last name, first name, and middle name, as well as any other names and aliases, your date of birth, your sex, your country of residence, if a passport is required, your passport number, your passport country of issuance, passport expiration date. Um, if a travel document other than a passport is required, the travel document type, um, the travel document country of issuance, the travel document expiration date, the address of where you will be in the United States, including the number, street, state, and zip code except that U.S. citizens and lawful permanent um, residents will provide address of permanent residents in the U.S., like your, your number, your street, your state, and your zip code, your primary contact phone numbers, and including your uh, country code, secondary contact phone numbers, including your country code, your email address, your airline, your flight number, your city of departure, your departure date and times, your city of arrival, your arrival date and times, your seat numbers. Um, and you can expect that on any conveyance that you are going to be asked for these, this type of information and you need to be ready to submit that information. I remember when there was something going on in, the, in Italy. I think it was um, 
a hijacking of a cruise liner. And I was taking a group of young, young Girl Scouts, I think they were brownies at the time, up to Victoria. And we were on the ferry. And these happened to be um, um, developmentally delayed um, girls. And I mean, they, uh, anyway, make a long story short, we were in this middle of this global thing and I was handed a three page thing, uh, uh, document, like if you were going to a doctor's office per girl, like their mother's maiden name, mother's place of birth, you know, all this stuff, three pages per girl. And these girls didn't know all that information. And I was terrified that I was going to be stuck in Canada and never be able to get back to the United States. In the end, I was able to, but it was um, not a pleasant trip to Victoria, Canada, I can assure you. These administrative records are going to be kept like I said, if this information gets to third parties who are processing that information, it will become public um, for the greater good. Talking about uh, the suspension of entry of animals, articles, or things designated from foreign countries into the United States, the CDC may suspend entry into the United States animals, articles, or things from foreign countries, including political subdivisions and regions, um, wherever the director determines that such an action is necessary to protect the public health um, when they find that there exists a foreign country, so that with there exists in a foreign country or a political subdivision, um, a place of communicable disease um, introduction, transmission, or spread, which would threaten the public health of the United States. Well, that's already been determined um, from China and by the United States. Um, so what that means is the whole economy or anything having to do um, with Chinese imports can be stopped. Um, the flow of peoples can be stopped at this point. It's going to be very interesting to see how what happens in the next uh, 30 days, because after that, we're going to know where we stand. I will say that just so you know, this has all been metriced out like they know how much it's going to cost per person that they are going to investigate. Um, it's going to be a huge uh, boom for uh, public health, a huge influx, huge influx for um, people making uh, vaccines, um, this whole surveillance. There's going to be companies getting surveillance money to manage this whole system. So we're basically, it's a redistribution of wealth. So we're transferring it from one place to another place. Um, they... I mean, they know like airplanes, you know, like if one, if a plane load of people, they knew when those early planes, how much it was going to cost um, the, the economy, uh, the surveillance system, the whole 10 yards. I mean, it's all in this, in this document. If you want to read it for yourself and see how it's going to affect the economy, um, the flow of peoples in and out, uh, that is why they were a bit slow, the World Health Organization and the United States, in declaring this because they knew that this basically could stop the world as we know it. And basically, in a nutshell, the world that you knew is over. They have all their ducks in a row for the management of the new world order, the new global system, the B system. So it's, they have to end the old one. It's being eradicated and whether it's real or perceived, um, it's over and they are transitioning us into this um, new world order. Um, part of this is the United Nations 
global millennial goals. They want those hammered down in this next 10 years. And they know that there are external factors like um, all these cycles that are converging from the heavens to deep within the earth and economic. It, it's the rise of countries and kingdoms and the fall and they want to be the ones to control the system at the very end when everything goes to hell basically so that's the reason that this has started um are we going to go back to normal no we're not going to go back um everything the system as i can see is fully um it is fully, they've got their ducks in a row and they are operationalizing it as the um, person that did the White House announcement said. They're operationalizing this new world order. So I hope that this helps you to understand what you may face and what we all may fa be facing in the next 30 days. It's going to be absolutely critical that we understand, um, can you resist? I think back in 2016, I thought um, that we might be able to resist um, more effectively than I do believe we can resist now. Um, I, I think if we try to resist now, um, it will mean your death, uh, quite frankly. Or, you know, because you, they're not going to let a few uh, resistors get in the way of something that they, for generations, for thousands of years, have been planning. So you need to pay, prepare your families. You need to prepare your heart. You need to prepare spiritually, uh, physically, any way that you are led to prepare for these days. Um, I will be doing more broadcasts on this. I'm sure there's more than one document. I know there's one more, more than one document on this. And it's important to know that really this <clears throat> novel coronavirus has not been named officially. They, the World Health Organization did say that they have not named this um, virus yet. So we really do not know really what we're dealing with. Will we ever know? I believe that uh, the character and the mission is embodied within a name. Um, that includes you and me, and we don't even have a name for it. They're just saying it's the novel coronavirus, but is it really? We don't know. And we don't know, is it real or is this just um, a, a, something to induce fear? so that they can go ahead and um, with their plans. Time will tell. We live in interesting days. I wish you the best. I hope this gives you information to, um, to digest. And if you do have questions, um, I hope to answer them in the days to come. Um, just be well and be safe and God bless. Bye.